Hey, it's great to be here at uh, the Academy. I want to thank uh, the Academy and all who host this 21st National Leadership and Character Development. I think it's really important. I think that we can't um, spend enough time thinking about this. It's foundational to our Air Force. It's foundational to the Air Force as we move forward, and not just the Air Force, but to our nation as, as we develop leaders with character. So what I'm going to do today, hopefully over the next few minutes, is kind of tell a couple stories from an old guy who's uh, been fortunate to be able to command a couple times in both peace and war about some of those things that, that I think are important um, as to how we build and develop leaders with character. Like every story, I'm going to start with people. In this case, you see a mosaic of my command. These are folks who work there. In each of those, there's a story behind them. There's some amazing people. They've got aspirations and dreams and motivations, and part of our job as leaders is to inspire them, to make their dreams come true. And so I look at those people and think every day I've got to wake up and find a way to make them better than they think they can be. To do that, though, I'm going to take a little step back because I'm going to talk about two people that are really important in my life. I think you can probably notice a resemblance. We go to the same barber. That they, uh... <laughs> the guy on the left is my dad. My dad's now in his mid-80s. He is a third-generation West Pointer. His grandfather and his father went to West Point. My dad's father, so my grandfather, was General Wainwright's aide when they surrendered at Baton. So on April 9th, 1942, the largest surrender in U.S. history. He was a Baton death march survivor. My grandfather had two kids, my dad and his brother and a daughter. My dad is also a West Point grad. Um, when you talk about, like everybody in this room, you know, we have some amazing families, and you learn about things growing up. And in my case, I got to learn about duty, honor, country, sitting around the dining room table. My grandfather was an amazing guy. If you look at those who went through the Baton Death March and how hard that was, and then he got to spend three and a half years interned in a prison camp. In his case, he was at Cabana Tuan in China. Unbelievably hard treatment. In spite of that, my dad still wanted to serve his country. So he went to West Point. He was an infantry guy, just like his dad. He, he uh, commanded a battalion in Vietnam, as did his brother. His brother was class of 1950, Gail Francis Wilson, at the United States Military Academy. His class was, as he graduated, entered the Korean War. Most of his class was killed in the Korean War. My uncle was spared, though, because he was a world-class athlete. He was on the Army pentathlon team. Remember the Pan American Games? He was going to the Olympics, and he actually went to the Olympics, but he didn't get to participate because he got hurt. My dad's brother was on a second tour in Vietnam when he was killed in a helicopter crash. He was a battalion commander. He's one of my role models. Standing next to him was my cousin, John Tully, another a great great American. Served 30 years in the Army, just retired in San Antonio, Texas. John was a company commander during Desert Storm in the 3rd Armor Division. Later, he commanded the, a combat brigade in Iraq in 2006. You talk about tough. So his brigade was about 3,500 people. It was assigned to Baghdad, Najaf, some really hard places to, to live at that time. The insurgents were killing people with IEDs, and they were killing lots of them. His brigade lost over 200 people. It's one thing to be a leader. It's another thing to be a leader at war when your nation is really counting on you, and you have to inspire some people in some really tough circumstances. So I tell people, have some heroes. Have some people that you look up to that know how to do that, 
to listen to their advice, to get some wisdom from them. Again, I'm, I'm fortunate. I was blessed to grow up in a family with a strong military tradition that lives core values. And those are a couple of my heroes that I want you to meet. Everybody probably knows this story, or I hope they know this story. If not, we haven't been doing a very good job telling it. This is part of the do a little raid right before it happened. Let's rewind though a little bit about how it happened and the leadership that it took to make it happen. Right? December 7th, easy, everybody knows that. What do we do next? The president said we need to attack Japan. We need to do something about it. He told that to the Joint Chiefs of Staff on the 21st of December, 1941. So Reserve Lieutenant Colonel came up with an idea that I'm going to fly B-25 bombers off an aircraft carrier to strike at Japan. The president approved that plan on January 10th, 1942. On the 1st of April, 1942, Jimmy Doolittle debarked on the USS Hornet. 16 B-25s, 24 crews. I want you to think about that for a second. Think about that timeline. A plan was approved on January 10th. On the 1st of April, I departed. I didn't even own the airplanes. I didn't have crews. They certainly weren't trained. We had never done this before. Talk about bold. Talk about daring. So when they were spotted before they planned to launch, they went on a one-way mission. 24 crews on the USS Hornet. Those who weren't selected were trying to bribe their way to be one of the ones that went, knowing it was a one-way trip. Of the 16 planes that took off, all of them went in and about their targets around Tokyo. One of them crashed at sea. One of them landed north of Vladivostok in Russia. The other 15 or the other 14 in China. A few of them were killed. Some of them got repatriated. Some of them took two or three years to get back, especially the ones from Russia. Jimmy Doolittle at the time thought it was a colossal failure. He thought he was going to be court-martialed. Instead, he was given a Medal of Honor. He went on to become the, the second commander of the mighty 8th Air Force. Today, we need bold leaders. We need leaders with vision who will dare to push the boundaries. We need lots of leaders today like Jimmy Doodle. I have two stories I'm going to tell on this. I'll tell the one my wife doesn't want me to tell. For those of you who have kids, when our son was really small, I'd come home from work. He'd be in his diapers. I'd play around with him for a little while. And then like every small kid in diapers, he'd make a mess. And I didn't want to clean up that mess. And so I'd hand him back to my wife and make some excuse about doing something. And she'd say, can't you smell that? And I'm like, well, I can't smell that poo-poo. I don't smell that. This is the cleaner version of that story, a picture I saw often in the Middle East. In this case, you see somebody, and what I see is somebody who feels powerless, who sees big problems, who sees problems that I can't make a difference with. Look around me, so I'm just going to keep walking. I'm just going to keep walking by this problem because I really can't do anything about it. And I think that's where leadership matters the most. To be able to take the initiative, to be able to say, if not now, when? If not us, who? That every individual can make a difference, but we got to start. 
too often we've marched by problems. All of us do. But real leaders are the ones who see something and say, I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to start. And the wave builds up behind it. The momentum builds up behind it. And things begin to happen. But it starts with initiative. I just picked a couple books. I know the cadets here hate this. Because I'm going to tell you, guess what? The learning doesn't stop forever for your life. Real leaders continue to learn every single day. I used to laugh when I was a wing commander about 10 years ago at a pilot training base. We pin wings on the cadets as they, or the young officers as they graduated, and they'd be like, whew, the learning's finally over. And I'm like, are you kidding? The learning's just starting. It just starts now. But what I'd encourage you to do every day is to do a little reading. Expand your horizon. It can be fiction, it can be nonfiction, it can be anything. Diversity of thought is really good. Don't let yourself get pigeonholed into groupthink. That's what reading does. It expands your, your worldview. Read things that, you know, in my world, I got people that, that don't like the job that we're doing, the mission that we have. Right? So I'm reading all the things that they're writing about. Why they think the way they do. We regularly encourage people to come to our command with a different opinion because I want to hear their way of thinking. Why they think the way they do. I may not change their mind. I'll probably learn something. But at the same time, I'll probably teach a little something. I tell people, if you don't continue to read and learn, then you become irrelevant to those that you lead. So every night, I try and read a chapter of something before I go to bed to expand my worldview. And I encourage you to do the same. Lifelong education. That's what it's about. OK, a little trivia. Name the year. 92. The original dream team. Let's put a little context on that, why we got to the dream team. Because we lost in the 1988 Olympics. We came in third. It was the first time we'd ever lost in basketball. So we put together this collection of people. At the time, they said it was the greatest collection of talent ever assembled, and they were awesome. Okay, look at some of those people there. Larry Bird, John Stockton, Charles Barkley, the great one, Michael Jordan. Anybody know the guy between Michael Jordan and Charles Barkley? Christian Leitner the only college guy who was assembled on that team. It got down to two people. He, from, he was from Duke. There was an LSU guy. Anybody remember him? Who didn't get picked? Shaquille O'Neal. They didn't pick Shaq. All right, let me point out what I think is important about that picture. What are they all doing? Sitting on a bench. Bench warmers. They're doing the same thing I did in high school and college. <laughs> That's actually the point of it, though. They're on the bench. Who's on our bench? How are we developing our bench? Each of those were incredibly talented athletes. Together, they were unbeatable. So today, we're working on hard how we build our bench with the right people, with the right education, with the right experience, the right training. That's the way our Air Force is going to move forward. That's the way companies are going to move forward. If you, if you talk to any CEO of companies, and I get to spend a little time talking to them, they're all incredibly focused on professional development of talent. Right? We are all on the search for great talent. 
that's an amazing assortment of talent. And real leaders know how to pick out and identify talent and develop talent and build talent and make talent even better than they thought they could be. You know, Michael Jordan went home in high school and went home crying to his dad because he got cut from the basketball team because he wasn't good enough. I talked to lots of people who were told they couldn't do this. They proved them wrong. Lots of time they had to a mentor, somebody they listened to, respected, who helped push, guide them, motivate, inspire them to become who they are. I think we could learn from how we build the bench, how we grow the bench, and how I tell our commanders today that your most important job is to build those who will come behind you. Seek and develop talent. So I went to a small state agricultural college in Texas. I got an engineering degree. I got an engineering master's. I hate to tell this to a group of really smart people, but I got a D once in college. It was in freshman English. Right? I had a really, I'm lucky to have gotten a D, to be honest. I probably should have failed it. English was really hard for me. Abraham Lincoln, arguably one of the greatest communicators our nation has ever had. 272 words that changed the course of history. That's what his Gettysburg Address did, in my humble opinion. All right, we all know it, we've read it. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers came forth, conceived a nation dedicated to liberty and a proposition that all men are created equal. In 1863, and it changed the course of history. I tell people today, your ability to communicate will separate the good from the great. And we got some really good ones today. The chief of staff of our United States Air Force is as gifted a communicator as I have ever heard in my life. He's remarkable. Last two weeks ago, I was with him at the Air Force Association in Orlando. He had the whole auditorium balling. I certainly was. I was on the front row with a bunch of people, eyes all welled up. But it's not just with the military. I've been with him in New York City when he was talking to the Council of Foreign Relations. And that night there was a dinner, and at the table that I was sitting at was some CEOs of billion-dollar corporations, and they were all crying. I've heard his stories three times, and I still cry when he tells them. But he has a way of powerfully connecting to everyone, to every audience, and he makes you feel it and believe it. Those leaders who can do that, who can communicate their idea, their belief, their passion, their reason, will inspire others. So I never started out speaking ever, and I was just in the back room and somebody said, are you nervous? I said, I, every time I talk to any group, I get very nervous. But I tell yourself to push yourself, push your boundaries. Find a way to communicate with those that you work with. Real leaders do that really well. It takes a lot of practice. We have a great role model to look at on how to communicate. What is wrong with that picture? There's just so many things I don't even know where to begin, right? I went to New Delhi, India. And wow, you talk about a chaotic, crazy city. There are 16 million people in New Delhi. 
I went there in September and I was just overwhelmed with sights and smells and sounds. And, and then I see pictures like this and I go, oh my goodness. I've seen, I saw one even worse than this. Instead of the mom in the back seat, there was about a six-year-old girl in the back seat holding a one-year-old. And I go, wow, ooh, it just made me so dang nervous I could barely stand it. You know, that's a new way about thinking operational risk management. One guy's wearing a helmet and everybody else stinks to be you, you know. What I use this picture to talk about, though, is I want people every day to feel the same nervousness that I see when I look at this picture and talk about empowerment. That that's how we're really going to be great, is when we empower our people and remove the obstacles and the barriers to their success and let, they, let them do their job. I recently had a discussion with a uh, colonel. And I've been going around touting the changes that are happening in our enterprise. And the biggest one that I see is this empowerment. Where people, people feel they can do their job and they don't have to be micromanaged. And this colonel said, sir, you don't really believe that, do you? you I mean, you don't really believe that 20-year-olds are empowered. I mean, they just, they don't know anything. They need to be told what to do and how to do it. And I was like, okay, we got a lot of work to do here. So let me tell you a story. I met a 20-year-old airman. He's at Barksdale Air Force Base. He works in the medical group, and he's a hospital administrator, and he does data entry. He takes data from this computer, and he puts it in this computer. And he realized, you know what? He was a high school, I call him a geek. He learned about computer programming. He liked to do it in his spare time. He goes, there's a better way to do this. So he built a computer program that automated so that he didn't have to go from here to here to do data entry, that it did it automatically. It's now used DOD wide. He's 20 years old. That's empowerment. We got some really, really talented, capable young airmen. We need to let them do their job. Just like any parent, when they give their kids the keys to the car for the first time, when they're fill in the blank, 14, 15, 16, we know that we've trained them right, given them the right education, they've got a little bit of experience, we're going to let them go do their job. We're all nervous, certainly the first few times. We've got to be that same way with our people. They were delegating down the level of responsibility and not micromanaging them. They are continuing to stretch and grow and be better, and all of us will be better because of it. So I'm a huge believer in empowerment. We got lots of these. Ah, we got way, way too many tribes. All right, where do I even start? We got Army tribes, Navy tribes, Air Force tribes, Marine tribes. Shoot, within the Air Force, we got fighter tribes, bomber tribes, tanker tribes, space tribes, cyber tribes. Go down the list, tribes. Within each of those little tribes, we have sub tribes. We got operator tribes, we got maintainer tribes. Mission support tribes, medical tribes, we got lots of tribes. And there's lots of goodness in tribes. They bring with them lots of ways of doing business, lots of good from how they've always done things. But I tell people, if you're not smart and if you just stay insular in your thinking and and you don't bring in the diversity across the different tribes, that you kind of go crazy. Everything becomes inbred, and you lose your mind. So I am a huge proponent about reaching across the different tribes, bringing in that diversity, 
of the power of everybody, whether it be the different commissioning sources, the different experiences that people have, the different where they grew up, the differences of opinion, the differences in thought, that collectively will be better because of the tribes versus insular in their tribes. So as I look across this room of, of uh, folks as, as they go about life, I'd ask that you don't you bring in the goodness of your tribe, but don't become so inbred in your tribe that you can't see outside of it. Our Air Force is a giant tribe made up of all kinds of diverse parts. And it takes all of us together, not just a single tribe. All right, and I know this group over here will get it because they were the trivia people before. These are probably really easy, known for different things, but some pretty incredible athletes, right? We have one on the Babe Ruth. Man, you talk about power when he stepped up to the plate. He was going to do one of two things, right, which he's famous for. He was going to hit a home run or he's going to strike out. Those, those are about the only options. If you look at his stats, he didn't get a lot of singles. He didn't either hit a home run or he struck out. He had the record until Hank Aaron broke it for home runs. He still holds the record for strikeout. The other guy, Ty Cobb, was known for what? Most singles. Right? He held the record for most singles until Pete Rose broke it. He also still holds the record for lifetime batting average. So if anybody saw the movie Moneyball, he was the guy that got on base. And how do you win ball games? You get on base. Once you get on base, you'll score some runs. And so that's why I talk about the small wins. Because those small wins are important because they're going to produce bigger victories. It's also important, I, you know, I tell people, it's okay to strike out. It's okay to fail. We're going to learn something from it. If we're not pushing the envelope on how we do things, then we're not trying hard enough. Occasionally, we're going to hit a home run. Occasionally, we're going to strike out. Let's learn from it and become better. But the other piece is we've got to also continue to get hits. Small wins, small victories that are going to produce big victories. I'll talk more about that in a future slide, but that's what we're embarking on on our journey in Air Force Global Strike Command. The 2008 Olympics. I happened to be in Winnipeg, Canada. I had a two-year assignment in Winnipeg, um, and I just tell you, this picture, I could spend probably half an hour, I'm not talking just about this picture, about what it symbolizes to me. First of all, we're going to probably be parts of coalition and allies going forward. And we don't have any, you know, the, our, one of our very best allies, or both of our best allies, could be in that picture. The Canadians of Great Britain. Canadians are wonderful, wonderful partners. They got a pretty small armed force. The Canadian Armed Forces is 65,000. I didn't say Canadian Air Force, Armed Forces. Canadian Air Force is 15,000. There are 13 bases. They're a microcosm of the United States Air Force. They are really small, but they're very agile, they're very nimble, and they can do things that big organizations can't. So I really like the way the Canadians think and the way they're able to, they're really thin and nimble, with the word I call strategic agility. The Canadians went from not having a helicopter, buying Army CH-47s, training crews, delivering them to Afghanistan, and from when the, the chief of the air staff said go, to when they were in Afghanistan flying, 
was one year. Right? They're really nimble. They're also big rowers. Who knew? I didn't have any idea when I was in Canada. Canadians are big rowers. Anybody seen rowers before? Anybody done that? Probably some, these guys are monsters. They're all about 6'4". They weigh about 210. They got about 3% body fat. They're incredible athletes. Incredible athletes. They got power. They got endurance. So I tell all you as leaders, set the example. Be that leaders in shape. Right? We talk about wellness, about being physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually ready to go. It starts with the foundation of physical fitness. Be that person who's in shape. The difference between first and third place was 1.4 seconds. I go, wow, think about that. Let me tell you what they do. They do a two-kilometer race. This is a 2008 Olympics in Beijing. Two kilometers, about a mile and a quarter. Five minutes and 20 seconds. Right? Say that another way. That's like doing a four-minute mile rowing on the water. I can't run that fast as they were rowing. What's the difference between first and third place? I contend somebody was just a little bit out of rhythm, a little bit less power, not quite in sync. So as leaders, we need to be in sync. We need to be in sync with our boss and our boss's boss. We also all need to be pulling in the same direction. Call this flow. When you have the whole team pulling together with a common purpose and incredible speed, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it as a leader when everybody's in sync, pulling together towards a common vision with incredible speed. It's really hard to get into the flow. It's hard to motivate, get everybody in sync. It's also not about you. Just like that picture, it's about the boat, the team. Canada, one-tenth the population of the United States, first place. Great Britain, second place. The U.S., third. I also use that as an example that said, folks around the world, it's a race to the top, to be the best. There's a lot of people that look around and say, hey, the United States got a lot of advantages. I can beat them. So our job, again, as leaders, is to keep inspiring others. I don't want to come in third. I look at this picture and go, I don't know how they did that. I don't know how that's. We do live in glass fish bowls sometimes, especially in the military. But I always, I'm going to use this picture and I'm going to talk about innovation. I'm going to tell a story my wife told me not to tell, though. Again, she's like, you didn't tell that. I'm like, yeah, I did tell it. So I'm going to go back 600 years <coughs> to a very famous battle fought by Henry V in a 100-year war, the Battle of Agincourt. Our history majors probably know a little bit about it. Henry did some different thinking. Back in those days, armies, predominantly infantry, predominantly knights wearing a bunch of weight because we fought with big swords, cavalry with horses. It would be 80% infantry, 20% archers. Henry V said, hmm, I'm going to do this a little bit differently. And he flipped the script. He had 80% archers and 20% infantry. People at the time thought he was crazy. 
But he had this new weapon he designed called a longbow. It's made out of a special type of wood called yew. It's about as big as a person, the, the archer, the bow that he pulled. It took about 80 pounds to pull this bow back. But if he did that, and he could train his folks right, he could shoot an arrow about 400 yards, much further than anybody had done before. So when they met at the Battle of Agincourt, he was outnumbered, and history will say it a little bit differently, anywhere from three to 10 to one. And the French owned the high ground. Hemmed in on this little valley with trees on all sides was a recipe for disaster. And as the French attacked on that rainy day in October with a really soggy field from the high ground driving down, Henry V let go with his archers. And they stopped the first line of defense with their cavalry. And everybody started piling up behind him with just made targets for his archers. Because he had trained his archers to be able to shoot 40 rounds, 40 arrows a minute. And on that day that the English still celebrate, St. Crispin's Day, they decimated the French. Right today, if you go talk to one of our British colleagues, they look upon this as one of the greatest victories they had in the Hundred Years War and how innovation changed the tide of the battle. There's also urban legend that the French, knowing that the archers, that he was developing these archers, figured out a way that if they cut off the middle finger, they wouldn't have the strength to pull back the 80 pounds on the English longbow. And so that at the end of the battle, as the French were running away in defeat, all of King Henry V's archers stood up, gave the French the middle finger, and said, pluck you. Because they could still pluck you. Could be urban legend, look it up. <laughs> Innovation. Innovation happens all around us. In 2000, there was this guy named Steve Jobs who had a bankrupt company that he was coming back from. He said, I've got this idea. I'm going to do this thing, and this you know, music may be something I'm going to do. A crazy idea called an iPod. So in a company that thought differently, I'd argue he's changed many of our lives here today. iPod went to iTouches, went to iPhones, went to iPads. We're now in version 6.0 of iPhones, and I don't know what version of other things. And it's got the lar largest market capital, 700 plus billion dollar company because somebody thought differently. I often tell the story that today we've been engaged in combat for 14 years. About the time that Apple's made its comeback. I go and I think back to the time that Steve Jobs was his leader and said, hmm, do you think he would stu stood by and let administrative and bureaucracy stifle his ideas from coming forward? Why do we? Innovation is in our DNA. It's our lifeblood. It's how we're going to continue to move the world forward. Today, we need bold, innovative leaders who are willing to, to challenge the status quo, to think differently, to make the Air Force what it needs to be, not what it used to be. Nineteen twenty six, the court martial that we're all familiar with of Billy Mitchell. What's that stands out from this picture? What stands out to me is there's one person standing up. Today we have a lot of that going on. Who is that person with courage 
right? When, when, I'm, when I'm really afraid and yet I still act. When I want to stand up because of something I believe in. When I want to stand up because of adversity. When I want to stand up because it really matters. So there's any great challenges around the world today. They can be small, they can be big. It could be bullying. Who's going to be the person that stands up? Sexual assault. Who's going to be the person that stands up? In my world, in an incident that happened about a year ago, think of what a would have been different if I had an airman who had stood up and said, this is wrong. Billy Mitchell had four people that supported him. They went to his trial. They, their name's familiar probably with all of us now. Captain Hap Arnold. Captain Ira Eaker. Captain Eddie Rickenbacker. Major William Brandt. I live in the Brandt house at Barksdale Air Force Base. Think of the courage it took for those four individuals to stand also besides Billy Mitchell as he's getting court-martialed. I'm in the Army Air Corps. This guy's getting court-martialed because he believes that strategic bombing can have an effect on the world. and I'm going to stand next to him. So today, I would tell people, I, we need leaders with courage to stand up when it matters, to speak the truth, to not sit idly by when things happen. We need courageous airmen. The power of relationships. Somebody asked me about this recently. I said, you know, with relationship, I can do anything. Without it, I can't do anything. Harvard Business Review wrote an article recently about unignorable moments. Our command suffered an unignorable moment a year ago. What is that? Unignorable. Well, it was certainly public. It was certainly systemic. It challenged the very culture of our identity and being. One of the first phone calls I made was to Vice Admiral Mike Connor. He's my counterpart. He's a buddy. Hey, Mike, have you ever seen anything like this? Has the Navy ever had anything along these lines? What would you do? What do you think needs to be done first? One of my other first phone calls was to General Ed Rice. He too had gone through an unignorable moment with the crisis at Lackland Air Force Base. I'd worked for General Rice. I built up a relationship with him. General Rice. Can you tell me how you handled this? Here's what I'm thinking. What would you do different? General Chilton, a mentor of mine, I called him up. The keynote speaker tonight, General Darren McDew. So General McDew and I had been roommates in Diego Garcia in 2001. But we'd had a relationship. When you have a relationship with somebody, you build in trust. You build in understanding. They were incredibly helpful for me. We started down a path what I call the John Cotter model on cultural change. All right, we had a crisis. So I've got a sense of urgency to make things different and better. 
Now I've got to build a team, a team of believers, from the youngest airmen to the crustiest colonel and everybody in between, and we've got to unite around a common vision. And we have to be able to articulate that vision up and down a chain of command, and people have to get it. They have to know it's the right thing to do, but they've got to believe in their heart with passion it's the right thing to do. Then we've got to remove obstacles from people's success. Then we've got to start hitting singles so we can build some momentum. And once people see it, they start believing in it more. Then we've got to make it part of the way we do business, our DNA, and ingrain that every day. So we call this our continuous force improvement philosophy of how we continually get better every single day. It starts with relationships. So I'd ask you as you go about starting careers and doing different things, who's in your Rolodex? Who's that mentor or coach that you can talk to, that can help you and across your career to keep building those relationships with people? So the, the um, title of this slide was Be the Sun. That's actually what my wife told me for about the first 15 years of my Air Force career. She would go back to the Aesop's fables. When you, get, when you learn mentorship, I said I learned around the kitchen table with my dad, and I learned it every day with my wife. And she'd say, do you want people to help you or not? If you keep blowing hard, all people are going to do is put the jacket on a little tighter and harder. You want people to take off their jacket and hand it to you. Be the warm sun. Inspire people. So look at this picture, and it really does inspire me. For those who haven't seen it, our Air Force Memorial in Washington, D.C. is incredible. At the time, people said, you know, you're putting it up here by the Navy Yard and what they didn't know is the Navy Yard was going to be demolished. It would occupy the high ground in Washington, D.C. You can see it from all over the city. It signifies airspace and cyber. It signifies our core values on integrity, service, and excellence. And it's framed by that beautiful sun, I say, that gives that positive, inspiring view, all wrapped around respect for everyone. That's why our core values matter. Why our institutional core values matter. That we can't just say them, we have to live them. And that when we don't, we've seen the consequences. When even a small, small, small number of our airmen don't live our core values. So let me turn back to the mosaic. You know, we live in such a blessed time with so many incredible people, and I get to meet so many of them. I met some today that, you know, our academy is in great hands. We've got some amazing cadets. We've got some just stunningly smart, talented people. And they make up our whole United States Air Force. As I showed you that mosaic of some of our airmen, I can tell you the story on any one of them, but I'm going to pick one. Staff Sergeant Brianna Brooks. She's an amazing airman. I met her about three years ago. She's a med tech. She was on her second deployment. She was in Afghanistan with two weeks left on her, on her deployment when she was out on a convoy. And she'd done, done over 25 of them. And in that convoy, on that day, a rocket-propelled grenade came blasting through her vehicle. She was heavily injured, shrapnel in the face, in her arm, in her leg. In fact, to this day, she still has shrapnel in her arm and her leg that they can't get out. She doesn't have feeling in part of her arm because it's still numb. What did she do? 
what every med tech does. She disregarded her own wounds and treated all those soldiers around her. Saved the lives of, of the three soldiers in her vehicle. She's an amazing airman. She's got a purple heart, an Army combat medic badge, an Army accommodation medal. She also happens to be the 2012 Air Force Airman of the Year. She's incredibly talented. At her big reception, at the big hoo-ha that they do in Washington, D.C., at the AFA banquet in September, when they were going to announce her, she was late. Why? Because in the back of the room, before they called her up, one of the spouses who was pregnant passed out. And she was treating her when they called her name up. And Airman Brianna Brooks, and everybody looks around, and I'm like, I know she's here. I saw her. I talked to her. Where is Brianna? Oh, she came up about 20 seconds later when somebody said, Brianna, we've got this. You're being called forward. Brianna just got married a couple years ago. I saw her at Whiteman Air Force Base a few months ago. She was very heavy uh, with child. She just gave birth here a couple weeks ago. She's uh, a remarkable airman at Whiteman Air Force Base. She's one of many that you get to see and observe every day doing incredible work for our nation and for our Air Force. So our job as the leaders is to make sure we're worthy of the Aaron Brooks. Everybody's probably seen this quote. It's not the critic. It's a person who dares boldly to make a difference. A shorter quote by John Quincy Adams would say something along the lines of this, and I'll paraphrase. If you inspire others to dream more, to learn more, to be more than they ever thought they could be, then you're a leader. And today, in our United States Air Force, and across our country, we need those type of leaders who can inspire others to dream more, learn more, and be more. Thank you all for listening today, and I'd be happy to take any questions from any of you on any subject remaining. Sir, I'm a cadet third class, Phil Sweet, from Omaha, Nebraska. And I just wanted to ask you about um, what it was like to command uh, strategic command. So, um, Well, what it's like, I'm the luckiest guy on the planet. Right? We have an incredibly gifted airman. When I say airman, I, I'm using this term as, as that's it's our officers, our airmen, our NCOs, our civilians, all the people who, who make up our command that are dealing with two-thirds of the nation's triad. They're dealing with incredibly powerful weapons. We talk about a special trust and responsibility that goes with those who have to use weapons every single day to deter adversaries and assure friends. Um, we're really committed on a, a couple fronts. Is we can't fail on job number one, and that is to deter and that we need to make sure we have a safe, effective, safe, secure, and effective nuclear force every single day. But we also have thousands of airmen engaged around the globe today, whether they be in the Middle East or in the Pacific, to win today's fight. So we have to be ready, and this will balance our today as our is uh, our capability with our readiness. That we have to shape the future. When I say shape the future, that's that's the human weapon system as well as the weapon systems that we own, whether it be 
the new bomber that's coming out, new, new missiles, a new ground-based strategic deterrent as we build that for the future. And we've got to build and empower the team. And we we've, we've, uh, have been sticking to those. And again, I've, I've been incredibly blessed and lucky to, to be fortunate to be in positions where that I was able to, to, to do some of the things that I've done. I've, I think I've counted, I think I've done 18 moves in my uh, 33 years. Uh, I've lived in Europe, lived, lived in the, every parts of North America, from the East Coast to the West Coast, to the North to the South, to Winnipeg, Canada. I've been fortunate to go overseas and have four deployments in the Middle East. Um, and I'm, I've just been very fortunate to have some great role models and mentors throughout my career. Thanks for asking the question. Good afternoon, General Wilson. Thank you for speaking with us today, sir. I'm C1C Nicholas Nolan, and my question is, after the nuclear scandal, there were many critics who said that the culture of the nuclear community was deeply flawed. In what specific ways is the culture of Global Strike Command changing, and how do you go about um, changing such a deeply entrenched aspect of such a large organization? Well, that's a great question. Let me try and answer it in, in short order. We talked about the culture change that we're going for them. I would say that in the past, the culture was such that uh, because of the weapons that we were dealing with, everything became micromanaged. The second part of the micromanaged piece is the mission had changed from doing what most Americans would consider a vitally important deterrence mission. So we kind of lost focus, and the focus then became on inspections, where inspections became the mission. So some of the foundational things that we're doing to change the way we do business is this empowerment. Um, if we started, if everybody's read the reviews, whether it be the, uh, the Welsh Harvey report, and that's from Larry D. Welch and Admiral Harvey wrote a report for the SecDef. Madeline Creedon and, and Rear Admiral Pete Vanta did one for the chairman and the joint staffs. And they were top down looking and ours was bottom up looking from our airmen and saying, let's listen to our airmen who are doing the job and how do we empower them and give them the tools necessary to let them do their job? And, and we came to about a 95% overlap between top-down directed and bottom-up. But we're foundationally changing how we do inspections. We're changing how we do PRP. In the operations world, and again, this force improvement program wasn't just missiles. It started off at missiles. It's now gone to bombers. It's now going to our staff. Is the, how do we listen to those people doing the job and remove the barriers to their success. We've foundationally changed training on how we chain missile leaders, how we test them, how we evaluate them, what their career path is, and we're embarking on that, that mantra that I talked about, being able to see people say, here's what I think I need to do my job better. See their, what, they've, what they've told us they need come to life and then believe it and believe that their, their voice had a difference and build that culture versus um, what, what I'd say is in the past was a culture of micromanagement and inspections. So we're on a journey. The Secretary of the Air Force and the Chief of Staff of the Air Force and all the senior leaders of the Air Force last week were at Minot Air Force Base to see kind of where we are a year later. And I would describe it as we all, all of us, the so senior leadership of the Air Force, saw a difference saw a different attitude, a kind of pep in a step, uh, a belief that, that they were seeing the, the, the fruits of their labor. We're, we're not there yet. We're not done. It's not a one and done. This, we're on a journey. But I think everybody can see where we're going on the journey. They're believing in it. They're rallying behind it. And I think we'll, we'll make us better in the long run because of it. But great question. Thank you. Sir, Cadet Fourth Class, uh, Trevor Bills. My question is, you said you had the crisis under your command. What steps did you take after that to uh, reinstill public trust? And could you see any of those steps being taken at the Air Force Academy as well? Yeah, so what we did, um, it's a great question. What we had to do is to instill trust. And again, I, uh, one of my giant concerns was that we would lose the trust and confidence of the American people. And, and so I went out, if you saw that the Secretary and I made a couple of very high visibility press conferences. We talked about the vast majority of our airmen, the 99.5% of our airmen who live our core values every day, uh, that, that what we had was a 
failure of integrity of a very small group of individuals who weren't representative of the larger group writ large, and that we had a safe, secure, and effective nuclear force. I think that, if, that that's really important that the American public know and understand that, that we have thousands and thousands of people who wake up every day that are really passionate, they're really dedicated, uh, they're, they are committed to their job and doing their job exceedingly well. That our job then became is we need to make sure that the senior leadership of the departments, from the president, the secretary of defense, the, the chairman, the secretary of the Air Force, the secretary, the chief of staff of the Air Force, uh, were able to talk about the importance of the mission and then and, and, and for good reason, you know, we've been distracted for many years fighting conflicts all over the globe. But this is a foundational mission for our Air Force. Our airmen under, need to understand it's important. And so you've been hearing the Secretary talk about the importance of the mission that they do. And then we need to back up that mission with the resources. And so what, what she would say is put money where the mouth is. And we're doing just that too. So we're, we're on this journey. And we're on the journey that I talk about that I talk, we've got to have some good people who enter the command. We've got to make sure that they got the right education, training, and experience. We need to make sure that they're confident and proud and personally and professionally fulfilled. And when we do that, we get mission success. If I don't do that, if, I, if I, any one of those blocks aren't checked and we, don't, and we haven't put substance behind it, we get something less than mission success at this end. And so that's what we're focusing on. The education, training, experience, confidence and proud, personally and professional fulfillment of all our airmen. In short, is, is where we're headed. So thank you for the question. Uh, good afternoon, sir, and thank you for your time. My name is Cadet Daniel Morrison. I'm from uh, Air Force ROTC Detachment 105 at CU Boulder. I was curious if, as to how bold leadership and innovation would apply to those of us categorized as 13N and how we can bring new ideas uh, to the career field and the command in the future, sir? Awesome question. Thank you. I, got to, I talked to some 13Ns today about just that. So let me give you a couple ideas. Um, I went to Vandenberg Air Force Base recently to the schoolhouse. And let me first of all say our schoolhouse instructors are awesome. They're incredible. As they saw the new lieutenants walking around with all their pubs, this, and it's, they had their pubs in, in essence what I'll call a milk crate. Um, one of them said, hey, sir, you know, it's, why don't we have these electronically? You know, we, we got things that pe people are flying around the country with uh, all their flight publications and e-books. Can we do the same thing here? You know what? We're looking into it right now. Uh, you know, I, I told our staff that the President of the United States can take his morning briefing on the most uh, secret stuff on the planet on an iPad. We can figure out a way to make our publications available to you digitally um, differently. That's one answer. The other answer is we're developing right now as we speak. I'm here with my, my A589 Brigadier General Fred Strauss. And uh, Fred is um, the guy in charge of our new ground-based strategic deterrent going forward to the future. So as we develop this new, uh, new replacement for the Minuteman Three, what does it look like? Everything from the, the rocket design, the engine, the propellant, the guidance, all of that the, for the flight system will be new. All of the command and control for it will be new. Um, what is it going to look? What's the operating concept that we're going to use for this new system that will be in place in 2030? I can tell you, we don't have all the answers yet. We've got a team of really smart people thinking about it. We brought in the missileers today in the field for their ideas. We're bringing in the maintainers on how would we maintain this new weapon system differently. We're talking the DARPA and the research labs and the MIT Lincoln labs and all the smart people on developing this new system. And the people who are doing the job right now are the ones we're listening to. So again, as we design a new weapon system for the future, they're at ground zero as an example on, on how we're thinking differently and using innovative ideas from some of our smart operators, maintainers, and security force people out in the field who are doing the mission right now. Yeah, thank you for the question. Thank you, sir. Sir, Cadet Third Class Elvers from Cadet Squadron 22. This question comes from your friend from Barksdale, who's sitting next to me. 
Uh, we're playing Barksdale's got a little snow on the ground. It happens about every 10 years. They got about a quarter inch today. They're, they're going, woo! <laughs> Sir, well, the, uh, the question was uh, regarding about four years ago, there was a, um, an incident with a nuclear weapon where an armed uh, nuke was accidentally flown on a B-52 from one Air Force base to another. And, then, uh, and they didn't notice until one of the people at the uh, receiving base looked at it and went, oh, dear, this thing's armed. Um, and obviously the, well, the potential uh, was Not armed. There was a, there was a, a Alcom that flew from Minot to Barksdale. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, um, so the the question was, how does you know something like that happen? Where did the the system fail? And then how is a commander uh, in charge of something? You know that whole system. Do you look at that and go, all right, how can we grow from this? And how do we how do we prevent something like this from ever happening again? Because obviously the stakes are rather large. Yeah. Okay, that's a great question. It happened in 2007. And as you know, we put in place many things. We had lots of reviews. So we had Schlesinger and General Welsh and Blue Ribbon panels that looked at that, that looked at the, across the spectrum of things that failed um, that allowed that to happen. Um, and we have, there was, I think, over a thousand action items that came out of those reviews that we've got after and fixed. I'll just give you one small example. Um, today, we have a task force called Task Force 204. It stood up all the time. It's got members that, that monitor every nuclear weapon um, and wherever a nuclear weapon is. And before any one of those weapons moves, they know where it is, who's moving it, why they're moving on it. And so they've got situational awareness of every weapon in our inventory. That didn't exist before. It does now. Uh, but we, we put through a myriad of, of a thousand things in place, everything from the squadrons, the weapon storage areas, the people who maintain them, the people who transport them, the leadership in place at, at the wings uh, to ensure things like that never happen again. Um, again, that was another one of those unignorable moments that we just let things kind of go by because we'd kind of taken our eye off the ball after 1992. We got distracted. We're not distracted. I can tell you that the 25,000 people who make up Air Force Global Strike Command are singularly focused on making sure things like that never happen again. Um, so that's, that's when we talk about the, the, the things that, that uh, we focus on. Number one, deterring adversaries making sure we got a credible force for the president to be able to, to make sure that we have a safe, in this order, safe, secure, and effective nuclear force. That we're able to win today's fights, build and empower the team, and shape the future. And that's, so that's, to do that takes a special trust and responsibility for all our airmen because nuclear weapons are different. That we can't have the all rats, darn it. You know, we can't have those. So that's, so that's what we wake up and what our airmen focus on every day. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, General Wilson. We have time for one last question. All right, I'll take it. <laughs> All right, C4C Willis, Squadron 4. All right, so my question goes in, um, in, in regards right now to the changing war and the changing doctrine the Air Force is adopting that we're in the, uh, the war in the Middle East and also the progressing conflicts in the Horn of Africa. What are some obstacles that you believe that many of the airmen, the cadets in this room will be facing once we become, once we become officers that will be different compared to the past generations? Hmm. I don't know if the obstacles will be that much different, but I will tell you that the, the one thing, the only thing that will remain constant amongst all of it will be change. Uh, a year ago, I got to sit on a panel at the Air Force Association down in Orlando. During that panel, they were talking about world events, um, and I talked. Two weeks ago, I was at, at, a year later, but two weeks ago, I was at that same symposium talking about the future. And what I said is, what's different is that last year, 
We were not talking about Crimea or Ukraine. We weren't talking about ISIS or ISIL. We weren't talking about Ebola. We weren't talking about any of that. And the world has changed that much in the last year. I can't predict the future, I, other than to tell you we'll get it wrong, that we've never been able to predict it. That anybody who tells you what the future will be is um, crazy. Right? It's, I don't have a better way to say it. It's, it's the world's dynamic. It's complicated. Um, the things I kind of talked about today, I think will hold true for leaders tomorrow. That we're going to need bold leaders, innovative leaders, men and women of character who are courageous, who can build and empower a team, who can inspire others to be better than they thought they could be, to lead for the challenges of the future. And I don't know what they're going to be. But I can promise you, you're going to have some. They're going to be different than the ones I experienced. They're going to be with a different generation of people. You know, today that I get to uh, spend a lot of time around millennials, and I love millennials. They're amazing. They ask questions, why? Right? But once, you've, once they figure out the purpose, once you can connect and they understand the why, and it's important to them, they're amazing. They're different than, than my generation. You're going to deal with generational folks. So maybe millennials, Gen X. You're going to even deal with old codgers like me. I don't know what it's going to be, but I think the, the same the basic things that I talked about today will hold true for the future. Um, they, will, they, will, they will help us. Uh, the relationships you build, the, the, the team you that have around you, that, again, that you can inspire to, to make a difference. I also tell people, as I get asked, I think Americans are in great hands. The people I get to see today in our ROTC detachments across the world, at uh, our universities, at our, at our academy here, are simply amazing. They're so much smarter. They're so much more talented. They're, they're so more thoughtful. They have a much bigger worldview than I ever had when I entered in the late 70s. So uh, the world's in great hands is what I look at. And we have great people, I feel like sitting in this room, getting ready to lead our Air Force. <laughs>